Hi everyone, my name's Nima. I'll be running today's session around trends. We have to stop as part of the Experimentation uh, Conference. My area of topic is, as you can see on your screen, the devilifying of the hippos. Now, if you don't know what a hippo is, you're not in the wrong place, it's okay. I've got a slight explanation for it, so give you some clarity around what we're going to talk about. And then really going into some theories and ideas, really exploring where this concept of hippos came from, what does it actually mean, and why we should actually stop villainizing hippos and what we should do instead with some tips and tricks around how to embrace your hippo in the office. So I'm hoping you get some practical ideas that you can take back to work and, you know, pick some goals. So let's kick off. I've got a really rough agenda that I thought I'd go through. I'm trying to make this as conversation as possible. I know it's pretty hard with me being the only person speaking, but ideally to be able to get you to think about future ideas and maybe connect with me and explore these ideas. So I thought we might start with a little bit about me. I'm not assuming everybody knows me, but I'm going to give you a little bit of a background around who I am, my experience, and why I picked this topic to put my hand up and talk about. Second part, I thought we'd talk about what is a hippo. Um, so most of us know, but it'd be nice to get a kind of a level playing field for everybody. And where did this actual idea of a hippo come from? So I remember I used to band here around a lot, but I never actually asked the question around where did this concept come from? So I want to explore that a little bit. And then finally, I wanted to do something around how do you, how do you build inclusive teams? So if we are going to de-villainize the hippo and bring them on the journey or we're going to embrace them, how do we build this inclusive community, which I'll explore some ideas with you. And then I thought I'd do a bit of a summary and a wrap up and then thank you for your time and you know enjoy the rest of the conference. So let's start with a little bit about, about me, who I am, my background. Now, yeah, most of you might know me, some of you might not, or most of you don't know me, some of you do. Um, I started an agency with uh, a partner of mine here in Australia, in Sydney. Um, Stacey is my uh, business partner and, and together we created an agency called New Republic. We did start as a traditional advertising agency and then pivoted into going into our heartland around user experience design. And funny enough, we realized that through that journey, we could really start to validate our designs by using experimentation, doing quick experiments to validate what we've designed through data. And so that became a really powerful proposition for us. And so experimentation was the fundamental core and little did we know that it was going to completely change the way we looked at design, the way we delivered our work, and fundamentally what we were going to be. We did start in the world of calling things CRO, conversion rate optimization, but we quickly realized that there are so many other applications that we really lovingly refer to it as experimentation. And for us within our agency for New Republic, it was really around how do we help organizations adopt a culture of experimentation? How can they embrace this idea of constant iterative tests that teach you something and allows you to pivot or validate that the pathway you're going is the right pathway. And that was a journey that we started in 2010 and we became big partners with organizations like Optimizely, Oracle, VWO and many others, and then partnered throughout the market. So fundamentally stepping into experimentation really changed the core of what we were, you know, from a UX design and validation business to an experimentation personalization merged out of the UX world. And then of course, anyone who plays in the space gets into data and analytics. Now we were fortunate enough to be early in Australia, one of uh, three organizations doing experimentation in, in 2010 in the very early days. And we really were building the foundations of what experimentation meant in Australia. And you know, I'm really proud to see there are so many agencies now talking about experimentation, executing experiments, all at different levels, and brands really adopting and, and being part of that foundation allows you to bedrock some of the core thinkings within the community and proud to say that we were part of that and helped build it as well. And that really helped us work with some of the biggest brands in Australia. Hopefully some of these you do recognize if you are from Australia and some of the international brands as well. We really pioneered in three verticals, one around the financial services market, one around e-commerce and automotive. And that's kind of where we started building our specialization. So during the time from 2010 to uh, 2020, 2020, when we sold the business to Deloitte Digital and we merged and became Deloitte Digital um, and expanded our, our offering, but also maintained what we were great at, we really got to see a broad range of 
experiments and a broad range of problems that we solve using experimentation and clients that we work with, both big organizations and small organizations and medium-sized organizations. And the common trend that happened in all of them, they all had dun, 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 this person called the hippo. Um, you know, there is no organization in Australia that doesn't have, you know, a hippo within them. And what I wanted to do was really stop and explore what is a hippo and what does it actually mean? Um, in the years of doing experiments, I had my fair share of people with opinions and how they believe that um, experiments should be run or worst case, you deliver the results and then they would say, no, I don't believe the data. I think we should do this, which was a very gutty experience because you've spent time designing an experiment, building it, QAing and getting alive, collecting the data. Um, you know, looking at that data in different angles to really understand what has happened, finally to have somebody say, no, nope, I don't trust this data, I'm going to go do my own thing. So, you know, no matter where you've been in your journey, you've always had a hippo either at the start or at the end of the program, and it's always frustrating. And through my pathway and through running all these experiments, I realized at one point having someone that did that was a really challenging experience, but that fundamentally was my job. My job wasn't to run experiments. My job was about bringing people on the journey. And I'm hoping that through this presentation, you'll take a bit of an adjunct, which I did through my journey, that really started exploring the idea of like, what really is my job here? Like, am I here to run experiments? Am I here to help build a culture of experimentation? Am I here to find the hippos, expose them and make them feel awkward and, you know, get out of the way? Really, what is my job here? And that's kind of the strategy um, by which I wrote this presentation and I'm sharing it with you today. So let's get into it. So I think the best place to start is, you know, I mean, I know we all say hippo and it's fun. And I hope you like this image that I found on the internet, but it's pretty bloody cool. Thank God someone likes hippos and did all this stuff. But I started, I thought, what does it actually stand for? So uh, most of you probably know this, but for the people who don't, a hippo basically means highest paid person's opinion. So whoever is the highest paid person in the, in the room or in the office who has any exposure to the experimentation program, you can classify as a hippo. Now, you might not call them a hippo if they don't give you their opinion, but when they do, they automatically become the hippo. But what you'll agree with is it doesn't matter what they do. You know, it could be a line manager. It could be the chief executive officer or chief something, or it could be the general manager. Any person who has the ability to uh, affect the test idea, the design, or the results of an experiment, in my perspective, you know, is a hippo. So that ideally is what a hippo is. You might find that um, these individuals that come into your program of work, who are the hippos, are generally there to cycle the program of work. But I really want you to think that what they're doing is not trying to stifle the work. What they're doing is they're standing to the status quo of the way they've worked. And it really is about the status quo. And as, and as I try to go through this with you, I, I do want you to start thinking that your job in running experimentation isn't about the actual test. It's about how you find these ways of working, these kind of standardized behaviors, and start to break these down. The outcome is an experiment. There's no doubt about it. But fundamentally, what you're trying to do is identify behaviors that protract or elongate the, the way that the current business is operating. You're not there just to run tests. You're there to shift the way they think about their business, the way they go about doing business. Generally, what happens is the individuals who stand up for the way it was or the way it should be, those people are standardly known as the hippo. But fundamentally what they're doing is they're maintaining the status quo because in the status quo they have control and in that control they know and they can control the outcomes or they believe they can control the outcomes. And so fundamentally, although hippos are the highest paid person, they're generally an individual who's scared of change. They don't want change because it creates risk. Now we're going to explore what that means, 
But ideally, the highest paid person's opinion is fundamentally the individual who really wants things to stay the same rather than change. And I want to explore how we actually identify those people. And then, of course, by through that process, I think, but how do we manage these people and how do we bring them on the journey with us? So really what we've got to be asking ourselves is, firstly, let's to understand what we need to do, let's figure out where it comes from. So the, the, the term fundamentally started with Google. So the data, the head of analytics at Google, in a in a uh, I guess in a presentation or conversation uh, style presentation, he he talked about the lack of data understanding within organizations, and he talked about that most organizations are run by the highest paid person's opinion, and the word hippo was born out of that. Now, fast forward, oh, probably about. 10 years and optimizely really picked that up and made a thing of it around um, the highest paid person's opinion is what is your kind of fighting against. And why that became really good is that if you want to unify a group of people, it's really great if you give them an enemy because they can focus on one person or one thing that they have to go out and, you know, fight against. And so I think, what both Google and Optimizely did really well was identify the individual in the organization that stifles progression, that stifles the ability to use data, what is now available to us, to make better decisions. And so the idea of the hippo was less about um, opinion-led uh, activities to really data-led activities You know, by organizations who fundamentally were trying to equip um, people within businesses with more data to make better decisions rather than the gut feel reaction of what we should do. So really the term was born uh, out of Google and then in my point of view, popularized uh, by Optimizely as a way of really focusing around, you know, data is the way to make better decisions and hippos get in the way of finding that data and growing that data. But if you think about it, what this is really kind of doing is it's breeding this kind of good versus evil mentality you know good being the practitioners that love the data and evil being the hippos who are against the data so it really became a um over the few years that this has been around it's really this kind of creating this kind of fight between two entities the challenge that you kind of face with something like that is that you're not unifying teams we're dividing them you know we're, we're pulling people apart and we found a common enemy in this idea of the hippo. And so our job is about let's go and prove the hippo wrong. Or let's, you know, the hippo is the reason why the program's not growing. Well, I, I want to give you another point of view. It's it's really not the hippo that's doing it. It's really our fault as practitioners because I think we get lost in the idea of running experiments rather than building cultures of experimentation and bringing people on the journey. And so technically... What I really want to challenge you on is if you've had a lot of experience in experimentation, you'll realize you you always face the hippos. The, the hippos are there and they'll always be there. The job that we need to do, the job that we need to do is fundamentally start to focus on building inclusive communities. And the reason why I want to say inclusive communities, because in the programs that I've run, there's always teams and within those teams, we run experiments and the rest of the business doesn't. And then we move between teams. And so what I found was if you can create communities around both in the, um, teams that are running experiments and people within other teams that are interested in experiments, if you can build inclusive communities, it becomes like a, 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 a moss on a rolling stone. As you roll, you pick up more people. And so by being inclusive, by bringing those people into the fold, you can actually do a better job in communicating the benefits of experimentation rather than just running tests and giving results or rather than just doing tests and going, here's the data, here's the data. Because fundamentally, the data is not the key, it's the people. You need to be in the people on board rather than focusing on presenting data with amazing results. Because the problem with that is if the people aren't believing or aren't on board, all they'll do is go back to their opinions and then through politics will bring on other people, which basically stifles your ability to grow. So I know I've been talking, at, you know, very theoretical. I want to bring you into some practical actions and activities. To do that, 
I think it's important that we look at how programs evolve, how we move from uh, different stages of an experimentation program. This is Romo Santiago from Experiment Nation. Every week we share interviews with and conference sessions by our favorite conversion rate optimizers from around the world. So if you like this video, smash that like button and consider subscribing. It helps us a bunch. Now back to the episode. I uh, built this quite some time ago and I believe that most experimentation programs, now there's no timelines here, but in essence, most programs go through three fundamental peaks, right? Think of it as climbing mountain, right? The first peak when a program begins, so, you know, an organization goes, right, we're going to build a culture of experimentation or a team within an organization goes, right, we're going to adopt the culture of experimentation is this idea of a political peak. Now, I'm going to explain each of these in a second, but where most experimentations programs begin is in the political peak. They then evolve into the operational peak. And from there, they evolve into the democratization peak. I'm going to explain each one in a second, but fundamentally where I see most programs falling over is that when programs begin, everybody believes they are in the operational peak. That's what they think. And the reason they think that is because in the operational peak, your key focus is about velocity and cadence. So I've broken it down here, which should give you an idea, but in the political peak, we're focusing on bringing teams together and setting up the frameworks for experimentation. In the second stage, we're looking at the operational peak, which is really about focusing on cadence, diversity, and velocity of experimentation. And the last one, democratization, is getting the program out into everybody's hands, getting everybody testing, right? Now, as I was saying, when most programs start, everyone believes they're in the political peak. They try to get as many experiments out with really good impact. They try to build their cadence, their velocity. But what they've forgotten to do is they've forgotten to bring on the other individuals outside of the team that's engaging or the, the um, team members engaging outside of, to bring them on the journey with you. And so what happens is because they haven't managed the politics and put in the right frameworks to bring on the people, they find at one point that their velocity and cadence is stifled because they can't get more money or people don't believe in the data or whatever it might be because they haven't brought people on the journey. And so the programming, Usually, as I find when we when we've worked with clients, is where programs fall over is in that operational peak because they haven't done the groundwork they needed to to keep it going. And where do all the hippos live? They live in the political peak. So you need to make sure you know what stage your program is in, and you need to understand the role of the stage and how it helps build into the next stage. You can't climb the operational peak if you haven't earned the right by climbing the political peak. So keep that in mind as we talk. So I'm going to deep dive into the political peak. The reason being is this is the land of the hippo. This is where the hippos live. This is the area where politics is more important than the tests you do. Now, I'm not saying you don't do tests. I'm just saying you have to bring people on board and you have to bring them on the journey. Most importantly, those hippos that we talked about, the highest paid person in the room, you need to get these guys on board at all, all ladies, apologies, guys and girls. You need to get them on boarded early, right in that political peak. So let's dive into it. What's the factors of a political peak? So in this area, you're focusing on establishing what are the metrics that actually matter to the business? So what does the hippo consider as results? What are their gut instincts as what is good and what is bad? If I deliver a result that says I'm going to get um, $24 million because of this test, would they think that that's not true or would they think that's possible? So understanding in their mind what is the limitations that they place on what is possible and not possible around the metrics that matter is key. So first, identifying those metrics. And then secondly, under understanding in their cosm, in their reality, what is a good result versus a bad result? Next one is around the team. Hard and soft. So hard, when we talk about the team, a hard team is the team that's running the program and soft are the teams that are influencing the program in some way. Now, that could be um, that could be that they're, sorry, let me just keep going. That could be that they're, um, uh, 
guiding or providing information. It could be that they're interested. It could be that they're involved, but in a part-time capacity. So it really comes down to um, how they're involved. But the hard team is the team doing the work and the soft team is the pe people around the perimeter who are involved in some way. Next, you want to try and understand the current BAU rituals and how the programs will change this. Now, this is something that just does not get done properly. And I'm going to focus on some of these in a second. But I know in a lot of programs that I've been brought into, what I notice is the team running experimentation has a way of working. And those things don't work into the current BAU rituals. And so there's always a challenge. So the way that work is prioritized for the IT department, because you need engineers, that the way we go, hey, here's an experiment, it has to collide into this, you know, long list of work that the engineer has then 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 experimentation down here. And so cadence is slowed down. So you need to understand the, the way the current rituals work. And then how does our program need to fit into that? Because you might find, hey, the current BAU rituals won't allow for a proper experimentation program. So we need to do something different. So understanding those rituals means you're starting to uncover what are the this is how we do it, or this is how we make decisions over here and why we do it that way. Because the hippos have a reason they do what they do. You need to understand and understand how to work within it. Next, you want to understand the political landscape and the hierarchy of influence. So the political landscape, you know, who's who, at the end of the day, we're all trying to impress somebody. Who is the hippo trying to impress? And if they're not trying to impress someone, what is the hierarchy by how they take in information, how they listen to that information come up. So you need to understand that hierarchy. You need to bring those people into the program. And a lot of times when I walk into these programs, no one's even thought about a political landscape or the hierarchies of influence. And so what ends up happening is you're running tests and the purity of running a test and going, here's a result, all exciting, how great you've done, but you've forgotten how information passes through this business. And you're trying to change it by going, look at this data point. Well, ultimately, people love security and stability. And so they go back to what they know. And so they start to dismiss the data, and which is a very frustrating experience. And I've gone through it and I've learned this by getting it wrong more times than I got it right and slowly figuring out what are the things that I was missing. And big one was around the hierarchy of influence. Then looking at the identifying the habits of decision-making, which we've kind of talked about, understanding the influence uh, uh, the influences of motivation. So why are the hippos behaving the way they are? What are their personal metrics? What are their motivators to think and behave that way? You know, maybe if we're doing tests that is counter to their metrics of success, well, no wonder they're not going to agree with you. Or if we're presenting data that they don't care about because it's not a metric that matters, no wonder they don't really care or they fob it off or or maybe in the context that we're presenting the data, we're missing other contexts that they need to make good decisions. So, you know, understanding motivations and personal metrics are key to knowing who and how to influence. And then the last two points, putting to place processes and teams and influence, well, that's uh, part of what we've been talking about. And then the last one for me, which is a real critical one, is you've got to play the long game. A lot of people think you walk in, do a couple of tests, and everyone's impressed you got to think that the program bringing people on takes time. You're fundamentally asking people to reconsider the way they've done stuff and to change it. And because it's in most programs, it starts within a team, like in the web team or the marketing team, and you're then trying to influence the GMs or the CEOs who just are so far away from that team that by the time the information gets to them, it's so distilled and so small that it doesn't really make impact. And so you've got to take the longer view that it's going to take time to build up and get the story out there and get them to consistently hear it. And so you've got to get them to care about the program, to walk down the corridor to those people and go, hey, I had this idea, I just want to test it. Once you do that, you get into that myth busting. Once you do that, then wow, you're in a whole different platform and universe. So let's now look at some of the key areas. Now, I want to focus on understanding the current BAU rituals, identifying the political landscape, understanding the influences of motivations of personal metrics and success, and putting into place processes and teams of influence. Now, I've got some tools and I've got some thought structures, thought starters for you around these four areas. Now, the reason why I highlight these four areas, to me, these are the four areas that are missed in most programs and why the hippo ends up winning is because these four things are not done within 
uh, a program being established. And so I, I wanted to take the time to actually deep dive into these. So let's focus on the first one around the BAU rituals. Now, what's important about your BAU rituals, what I want you to do tomorrow in your program or in the programs you're about to run is slow down and ask the question, how do you do the work that you do today? How does work go from an idea through to being accepted, through to being prioritized, designed, developed, and then released, and then reported on? You understand those rituals because fundamentally you're about to change them. Because the organizations that I would work in, yes, they're agile, but they're agile at producing um, uh, output. They're not agile in using data to question if what they're doing is right. They're good at just producing output. And they've got a method in rationalizing what they go ahead with, what they don't. Whereas experimentation slows that process down slightly and focuses on using data to make better decisions. It is a better way to work. I mean, I wouldn't have built an agency around it if I didn't. But fundamentally, it is a cultural shift. It is a mental shift. And it's a big change. So the first thing you need to do is understand that A, this is going to take time. And B, you're going to have to try different things to really get the program humming within any entity or organization you work with. So you first need to figure out what are the BAU rituals. So, you know, as I'm showing you in this curve, the learning curve, it's going to be very slow at the beginning. And focusing on just testing is not the right thing. So go out with a paper and pen, sit down with some of the different product teams, sit down with some of the GMs, sit down with some of the um, the outside, so in financial, the financial services, um, anyone to do with governance and legal would have to sign things off. Understand from them how they get work in. Understand how they sign off that work. Understand what are the methods, how much work, what's the capacity that they need. Then look at how does work get prioritized in for the engineering team? How do they pick what work? Who's the person who decides who does what work? Is it a project manager? Is it the the CTO, how does that work get prioritized? You need to map out the BAU work and then you need to figure out how does your program fit into that because you can't ultimately, unless you've got complete buying by the CEO and they've put money in to completely redesign everything, which is really an organizational change, not experimentation, unless you've got that, in the most cases, you're trying to fit into the way work is done today. And so a big part of your job is not running a test, but understanding how a test will run through the organization and what are the rituals that have to stay and what are the rituals that are open to change. Now, by doing this, you're, you're not creating a situation in which the hippo wants to keep things the same because they understand how to work with it. You're starting to work within the confounds of the business. And so you're starting to do work that stuff to bring other people into the job especially when you consider that it's all about creating hard, most importantly, soft, hard and soft teams, people doing the work, the people who have influence on the work. That includes the hippos and all the other individuals that you need to call in. So mapping out your BA ritual, BAU rituals, is a critical step in making sure that you're creating a program in which the hippo is being included and the world that they need is being somewhat respected and fed into the program work that you're trying to get up and run it. Now, the next one I want you to think about is your hierarchy of influence. Now, the way that I've researched and I've kind of found is that organizations have two hierarchies. You have your macro and your micro. So your social system. So if you think about the hippo right at the top, the individual level right up there. So your hippo sitting up there making decisions based on their own individual. Understand there are layers underneath that individual that is changing the way they think, the way they go about taking in information and making decisions, right? Now, remember something, the high pay, highest paid person's opinion, they didn't get there by accidentally being there. They got there through experience. They know something, they know the market, they understand something. Someone has appointed them or put them in that position because they have knowledge about the category. And that knowledge is not always right, but it's also not always wrong. So understanding how they got their knowledge, understanding how they go about making decisions is absolutely critical. And understanding the hierarchy by which influence is created. So you've got your social systems. These are the macro, the world social systems that we all can find. Then you've got the industrial level. So within the industry you work in, there are certain no social norms that everybody adheres to, right? So 
um, if you think about a social norm within, um, say, catching a train, it's socially accepted that when you get to the machine, you got to tap and the doors open. So this is a, an industry norm to travel on public transport. There is a payment and the gate will open. You have to tap it for that gate to open. And so it's a known fact within that category that that's how you enter public transport, right? And so it's no different to any organization. There are industry norms, there are social norms like humanity and then industry. And then you go into the organizational level. As an organization, how do we think and how do we behave? What are the, the um, uh, influences or the hierarchies in the way, the way we behave within this organization? Most people will know this as your values um, and, and, and maybe some outlines around accepted levels of behavior and how we work, right? Then there's routines. Every team has routines, e.g. stand-ups. Um, uh, they have routines around how work might be QA, but there are routines. And then there's the individual level. Now understand, every individual is influenced by all of these macro and micro um, hierarchies of influence and how they shape and think. You need to sit with your hippo and understand, it might not be so much the industry level, but it could be the organization and the routine level, understanding how those influence the way they make decisions. Now, they might be have been in industry for many, many years, and they might have a lot of knowledge about the industry. So understanding some of the agreed hierarchies of influence within the industry. So what are the agreed ways that this industry works or how consumers behave in this industry Learning from them is critical because it actually helps shape your program as well and also helps you understand how they go about making decisions because, of course, they're tapping into past experience. But, you know, we as experimentation practitioners, we understand that the past doesn't always mean that the present will always be the same. The precursor of what happened five years ago does not mean that today will be the same behavior as the past. But these people are in these positions because they understand those things. They understand what has happened in the past. They understand those patterns and they try to replicate what they've done in the past, successfully done in the past, in the organization they're in. So it's, it's important to understand what are those influences of the past that they're bringing in. The next part is around behaviors within the organization. What are the ways that they're behaving because that's how it's done over here, you know? You've probably heard this before. So understanding that's important into the program. And then what are the routines that they have? What are the rituals and routines that they follow in how they make decisions? Now, I'm not saying you do those routines, but you need to understand it and respect it. And so when you come to doing it your way, you need to understand that routine is about to change. And if it is about to change, who do you have to bring on board for that change to occur? Again, you'll find a lot of the times they're your hippos. They're the ones because they've created those routines. They don't like the new way that things are being done because it questions the way it has been done and they it's succeeding so why change it and so it's really critical that you understand and map these things out and start to think about how do we influence these how or who do we need to bring on board to influence really critical stage and something again i seldom see happen now this next part is something that i learned whilst i was at deloitte i thought it was a fantastic tool and it's something that really brought me on board um, and I wanted to integrate it into programs of work everywhere. Now, it's something that Deloitte does. It's called business chemistry. And what business chemistry does, it allows us to understand the influences and motivators of behavior. So we meet these hippos. They behave in a certain way. And I wish I knew this early in my career because it would have made such a different change. Now, business chemistry is something created by um, Deloitte. And what they basically talk about is there's four types of people. Now, you, you can have a major and minor in, in these four quadrants. Now, these types of people behave in a certain way. So you can either be a pioneer, which is people who are very much thinking about, you know, what's the future? We're going to go over there. It's going to be amazing. And they want to bring people on the journey with them. They don't care too much about the detail, but they're very much about, hey, you know, it's going to be amazing over there and we should go and it'll, all, it'll be hits of opportunity and we'll all prosper. <clears throat> the driver on the other side is very much like the pioneer. It's all about getting out the outcomes and so forth, 
but they don't really care who dies in the process. You know, whereas the party wants to bring everyone on the journey and make sure they're all safe and everyone loves it. The driver, it's all about the outcome. They, you know, who dies in the process, that's just sacrifice. It has to happen. They want results and they want to get there quickly. Now, underneath the driver is the guardian, and the guardian's all about the detail. You've met this person. You know, they're the one that when you have an idea, they're always telling you why it's not wrong or poo-pooing the idea or talking about all the risks and talking about why it can't happen and they want all the detail and they feel very slow and they they, they don't rush to make decisions and they drive people like pioneers and drivers, they drive them insane because they just want all that detail and they slow everything down and frustrate everybody. So guardians are on one side of it and then finally you've got the integrators. Similar to guardians but not, and, and similar to pioneers, not they want the detail, but they're willing to take a level of risk. They, they understand that we need to go towards the opportunity, but they want to make sure everyone comes and everyone's safe, and, but they want the detail to be able to do that. Now, what this map gives us is the ability to kind of look at our hippo in a very different way. We can start to and think about the person who you might have in mind, your hippo. What kind of person are they? Are they a driver? Are they a guardian? Are they an integrator or are they a pioneer? And once you understand this, you start to realize how you need to talk to these people. Because if your hippo is a driver, they're all about outcomes. That's all they care about. They don't care about the process you talk. They don't care about the statistical validity. They don't really care about, you know, how you dissected the data. They just care about what was the result. What was the result? Was it good enough? Or it, does it prove it right or does it prove it wrong? And so drivers are outcome-driven. Telling them the details and the science behind the working, you're going to lose them. And so knowing your hippo and where they sit on this allows you to start thinking about how do I communicate my experiment? How do I communicate the results? How do I communicate why this experiment? You know, and there's certain things that you don't want to do. Like guardians, for example, you don't want to own the idea. You want to be able to say, look, I've got an idea. Here are 10 reasons why we shouldn't do this idea. But if you do want to do it, that's okay. And if you don't, that's cool too. But I want to give you all the details so you can make the right decision. Now, you, if your hippo is a guardian, they will love that. They will love to understand how you got the stats sick. They will love to understand how you find that. They love the detail. And by knowing how to talk to them, and you know what I find is most people in experimentation are either pioneers or the integrators but when they come up against the driver, like the CEO who wants results, they're really keen on talking about uh, culture of experimentation and how we can pe take people on the journey and the job. It's like, give me the results. What result will I get for that? Where's the ROI? And so they, they're at polar heads with each other. And so they don't understand each other. And so one becomes the hippo and one becomes a frustrated experimentation practitioner. So using a tool like this allows you to figure out how to communicate. Now, there's so much documentation about this. I know one slide never does this thing justice, but there's a lot of documentation. Look up business chem chemistry on Google, you know, Deloitte business chemistry, so much information. And it is fundamentally fantastic. Now there's other tools similar to this, but what I would um, implore you to do is learn how to talk to your hippo, learn how they think, learn how they talk and learn how to communicate to them because communication is key to building these communities of inclusiveness. Now you've learned how, what influences their decisions. Now you're learning how to talk to them. So now let's look at how do you build teams of influence? And I talked about hard and soft. Now, a lot of people focus around the team running the experimentation program. But if you think about it, there are so many teams within an organization. There's influencing yourself, which is at the heart of it. How do I get absolutely best in myself in running experiments? Influence others. So how do I get other team members to run experiments? Influencing your team. How do I get my team to be the best? And then influencing the organization. Now, fundamentally, when you're running a program, one person in the team should really be focused here. How do I influence the organization? And understand how to influence the organization is you're using tools like these two and this to understand how to influence the organization. This is the space in which we are truly lacking attention. A lot of people spend time here and they spend time here, but they don't spend enough time here in influencing others and influencing the organization. I feel like if we can focus on influencing others, your hippos, 
influencing the organization as a whole, you have much better programs because you're now bringing people into the journey. You're learning how to talk to them. You're learning the drivers of their behavior, how they're motivated, and you understand the way they do things today and how you either going to have to walk them through the change that has to happen or you understand how to work within the confines of what they're doing. Now, I am going to slowly have to wrap it up because we're, we're starting to get over time. Now, the last one I want to bring up is I, I um, recently I've, I've been consuming books and I've, I've sold my business. I've left now um, out of Deloitte and you know, I'm still quite passionate about the space. And recently I read a book called Atomic Habits and I just, I just love this idea around the habit loop, you know, cues, cravings, response, and reward. If you think about it, your hippo goes through these four stages. They have a cue, I have a problem. Two, they have a craving. Let's go solve this problem the way I think I should. Three is what's the response? You know, I've done it. What did I get? And then four is the reward. And so habits run through these four. All hippos or all people within an organization will follow similar patterns, right? Now, what I would say to you is as you're building your program in this political peak, follow these stages. Look at the cues that they use in going to the, uh, the product managers or whoever they go to. How do they go to them? So identify how to make your experimentation program obvious to them. So next time the cue comes up, they come and talk to you, right? So how do you make it obvious in your program to come and talk to you? Next part is how do you make it attractive? You know, if every hippo was a child, I'd just give them a chocolate. I mean, it's very easy for them to come to me, right? How do I make it attractive for them to come to me? What can I do to make them engaged? Is it that, that I celebrate their experiments over every other experiment? Or I, I credit the idea back to them so that they feel inside the larger organization as hierarchies of influence that the people who they are trying to influence see them and see the work that they're doing? Is it about making it attractive that way? Is it the reward of the attractiveness of, hey, I could potentially show people some great results? How do I make it easy? You know, don't, I see a lot of people when they say, you know, what's the data? How do you know that's the right test? You're not making it easy. You're making them do more work. How do I make it easy for them to actually come into this program? How do I make it easy for them to get the results? How do I make it easy for them? Because you know, fundamentally, when something is hard, people steer away from it. So how do you make it obvious? How do you make it attractive? How do you make it easy? And then the last one is, how do I make it satisfying? How do I make it feel like, wow, that was a great experience. You know, when I talked to the guys, they gave me the data, they made me feel confident, they talked in a way that I can understand it, you know, and I look at the way they, they've made me look good in front of my bosses. And they made it so simple, the process so simple, that I want to go back to them again. It's so satisfying. I want to work with them again. So using this habit loop as a way of thinking around how do you get the softer team, the wider organization involved, I think is critical in being able to bring the hippo on the journey. So these are tools that I'd love for you to pick up and use within your organization on how to include and embrace your hippo. Now, last one I want to show you is um, uh, peak testing. Now, this is something that I came up with is a lot of times when we're building our experimentation program programs or, you know, our, our, team, our, our um, testing structures, you know, we look at data, we look at the category, we do some qualitative and heuristic led experiments. So we, we build a bit of a, a matrix of all this stuff that informs a test plan. But what we don't do is we don't actually go and talk to the hippo and say, Hey, what are the five myths that you hold true or, five things that you hold true about the customer behavior, five things that you absolutely believe are fundamental to how our customers buy to us. Or what's your gut tell you about, hey, I found this data, what's your gut tell you about this? What do you think we should do? Bring those into your experimentation plans. Now, I know they're quite the opposite of how to run a proper program, but fundamentally, nothing brings a hippo into the journey by seeing their own tests, A, go live and see the results of those tests. You only need to do this a few times until they get hooked on the idea of the experiments. Now, I found in my career, one of two things happen. They're right and the data validates that they're right and they feel empowered by that or they're wrong and they very quickly realize that the data is telling them something. Now, now some people will dismiss it. 
but you got to keep trying. Like I said, play the long game, not the short game. You know, it's going to take time and a number of trials. But fundamentally, two things might happen in this point where they find out that they're wrong. They might dismiss it, which you need to go back and try something different. Or they might realize that those myths that they held were not true. And so this is a really great way to get assurances into what is the right way to do things and get data for that. So you got to, if they dismiss the data and go, oh, no, I don't believe that, great. Why? What is it about it you don't believe? How can we work through this together, understanding who they are and how they communicate? How do we work together in starting to bring more of your ideas into our experimentation program? Because you want the hippo because they're the highest paid person, they are the people with money and budget. They are the people you need to convince first before anybody else about the program. And so bringing their ideas and their thoughts or their myths or their experience into the program is fundamental for the success of your uh, of your program in the future. Now, like I said, um, training, I think I spelled that wrong. Training hippos takes time. Don't give up. You know, get them in the gym with you, work out with them. Don't give up. It's a learning cycle. And just remember, when you're in the political peak, your job is about the people. It's not about the experiments. It's not about the number of experiments. It's about bringing the people on the journey with you. So it's understanding how they talk, how they're influenced. So training these hippos to come on the journey with you, it's going to take time. Don't be in a rush to get out of the political peak and get into the fun stuff and the operational peak because if you don't do your groundwork, it's like building a house. If your base is not good, the house will fall down. So finally, in summary, I just want to cover off the key points that we've talked about, right? The challenge is that he both both can take many forms and, and faces. They're not always the executives. That could be anyone in the organization that might stifle your program. So be ready to identify who they are and figure out how to work with them. So key part is figure out how to work with them. The idea of um, you don't want to segregate hippos out of your program. More than anything, you want to bring those people on first before the rest of the team. Remember the three peaks. Remember that in any program, you have three peaks you're going to have to go through. Don't be in a rush to get to democratization. I know everybody is. Don't be in a rush. Get your ground floor work done in the operational peak. Um, what are some of the other ones? Uh, key things, understand their motivators to success. Spend the time to understand them, understand how their metric for success, understand the rituals that they follow, understand the environment in they work with. Remember your program has to live symbiotic. You can't just walk in and change everything. You need to live in harmony with what is currently happening. Now, that's not saying everything has to always stay the same. You might find that you need engineers to get your experiments up. So one part might need to modify and you might need to bring. But remember, if you brought the hippo on board, getting that extra engineer is going to be a lot easier than if you're fighting with that person and trying to prove that experimentation works and you can't get an engineer to support you. So remember that you need to work within this environment and you need to understand these people so you know how to influence them. Um, and most importantly, and I think it's the last point given time, I really, really want you to consider, you know, I know it's not right practice, but bring gut feel test ideas in, bring the myth busting tests in. Because remember, you're in the political peak. You're in the peak of bringing people on the journey. So don't worry about the purity of tests. Worry that you are bringing the people on board rather than you're doing tests that are backed with data. You're doing you're doing tests to make sure that these people believe in the idea of experimentation. So look, with that, I don't want to take any more of your time. I just want to say thank you so much for letting me be involved uh, and thank you so much for taking the time to watch this. I really, really hope that you've learned something out of this. I really hope that there's some stuff here that you can take on um, to your programs or your future programs, either within the brands you're working in or with the clients that you have if you're at an agency. Look, if you do have any questions, please reach out. Contact me at nema at whitemaven.com, which is a consulting business that I've just set up. Or fundamentally, come and find me on LinkedIn. I've got tons of thought pieces on this. Always happy to share. You know, I'm no longer running an agency, so 
I've got a lot of time and love affair with this space. Love to help out your programs and give you any advice that you need. Reach out at any time. If you need any of these resources that we just went through, let me know. Happy to share those or talk in more detail. So with that, my friends, thank you so much for your time. I really hope you enjoyed the session. I hope you got something out of it. Uh, and if you can, let Ron know that it was fantastic. So we'll come on board and do another one soon. Thanks again. Have a wonderful, uh, have a wonderful day, night, wherever you are in the world, and enjoy the rest of your day. All the best. Bye. This is Romo Santiago from Experiment Nation. Every week we share interviews with and conference sessions by our favorite conversion rate optimizers from around the world. So if you like this video, smash that like button and consider subscribing. It helps us a bunch.